Welcome to Writer Talks. I'm Elizabeth Ann Adkins, and I am co-creator of Two Sisters Writing and Publishing. Usually on Monday evenings, I interview the winners of our monthly short story contests. And tonight we have Scott Bessenecker. He is a dynamic writer, podcaster, teacher, and all around interesting person who has a lot of experience. So right now he is on a quest to get his four unpublished novels published and he wants to turn the tables and interview me tonight because I've been published by New York publishers. I've had agents. I have self-published and our company has published nearly 40 books. So hello, Scott. Welcome to Writer Talks. Hey, Elizabeth, and welcome to Writer Talks. Um, (laughs) All right. Talk to me a little bit about the hybrid thing. Like, you know, I've had the Hey, we'll publish your thing. You get to pay for it. Like, is uh, is that like, uh, I might as well just self-publish. Self-publishing, if you've never done it, has 10,000 steps that you have to follow, such as getting your own ISBN, knowing what an ISBN is. What is a barcode? Where does it go? What are the permissions I might need to seek in order to publish certain content in my book? How do I write the, what's a foreword? You know, there's so many steps to self-publishing that people don't realize if you want to put out a quality book that we have done it so many times, we provide the service as a one-stop shop. So instead of having the headache and maybe nightmare of doing it yourself, we do it for you. And so did you start doing that just because you were frustrated at, um, A, how hard it is to self-publish? Or B, you know, the industry is, you basically have to come with your platform if you're going to publish it with a major publisher. And it's like, there's too many good things out there. Let's create a space that, you know, we can be a step above self-publishing or I don't know, above may not be the right word, but make it easier. Right. So, so I've been published by major New York publishers. My first three novels, White Chocolate, Dark Secret, and Twilight, which I wrote with Billy D. Williams, the actor from Star Wars. Those were published by St. Martin's Press. I had a literary agent. She handled all the contracts, all the negotiations, et cetera. That was awesome. But then there came a time when I was trying to get some works published, not succeeding. I self-published. I learned how to do that, but it was before Amazon was big. So I literally had the boxes in the garage and that that whole deal, right? But then Catherine, my sister and I decided that because of the technology that evolved, that enables people to publish on their own, she and I investigated the possibility of creating our own company. Therefore, we did. And we decided to do all the work. And we were organically attracting people who had amazing against the odds success stories with diverse voices, of all background stories, experiences, and it's amazing. So we're really excited. And thus that is what it is because many people with amazing stories may lack the platform that the traditional publishers are looking for to monetize the, the deal. And so we provide that service for them. Okay. You are two sisters. There's another sister. Like, is she not in the room because this has been so trying? You guys just aren't talking to one another. And like, (laughs) what does she do? So Catherine Greenspan is my sister, real sister. We're one year apart. She lives in Oregon. And um, she and I, you know, we have clients all over the country. So we work over Zoom. We've been doing that way before the pandemic started. And she is a certified financial services professional. And she's got many years experience in that field, whereas I'm like the visionary who's off in the clouds thinking and writing and creating. So she is also a writer, a published author of the Veronica series, Young Adult Novels. So she and I, who both have master's degrees in writing, um, decided to take my experience with ghostwriting, her experience with business and financial services, create a company and cover all the bases. Great. And is, do you think she's watching tonight? Uh, or does she'll she like, be very amused when she watches the replay. Okay, <laughs> she she is she'll watch it later. She doesn't do the live show sometimes. All right. Well, I have a few questions for her about working with you, but we'll save that for another interview. Um, talk to me about getting an agent. So, like, 
I've used something called Query Tracker, which allows you to kind of search for agents in your genre. And first of all, like locating my fiction work, which is a kind of speculative fiction, post-apocalyptic, it's really post-dystopian. I don't want to talk about the apocalyptic event. I want to talk about what comes up after, you know, hell breaks loose and the dust settles. Ooh. So locating that is like, okay, is it young adult? Because I, I do, it's not, you know, it's fairly clean. Mm -hmm. um, Post-apocalyptic generally isn't a category you always find, sometimes speculative fiction, but you're looking for an agent. You're trying to place it in that agent's wheelhouse. Like even just finding an agent, I probably appealed to a hundred, literally, with what I think is such an amazing set of stories. Like who would not want to publish these? <laughs> oh, yeah. But I can't I find an agent. I don't know if it's like, oh, I need to be able to slot it in the right spot. If I'm trying to do literary fiction, which I kind of like, I'd like to think it's a very poetically written uh, set of books. Mm -hmm. It's almost literary fiction, but it's fairly action oriented. Uh, maybe it's commercial fiction. Like, I don't even know how to slot it. That may be part of the problem. That is but huge. It, any advice on finding an agent and you're not quite sure where your where your stream is or who your people are? So I think that you absolutely need to define your genre because they have to pitch you to acquisition editors at publishing houses and they can't pitch something that's nebulous. They have to know what genre, what line, what imprint it might fit into, which all has very, which all have very specific uh, guidelines, submission guidelines. And so they might have a specific word count or sort of a sort of template of what they're expecting and what their readers are expecting. So I would definitely take some time for you to um, crystallize your message about your elevator pitch for your book or books so that you're very clear when you say this to the agent, because when you confuse, you lose. Um, so that's really one important step. I think that first of all, taking the action, setting the intention creates universal momentum in the energy field of our lives. And that tends to attract opportunities for you. That really does happen. That's how I got my first agent. Um, so what I recommend also is the any writing conference where there are face-to-face -face meet and greet, even over Zoom, virtual ones, where you can meet agents and editors, have those agent editor appointments at conferences, highly recommend. You have to find an agent that you click with. They have to have the right personality, chemistry, demeanor, communication style, and they have to believe in you when nobody else believes in you. They have to believe in you when they have a stack of rejection letters this thick, and they still think you have the next best zombie novel that's going to hit the hit the bestseller list. Um, another way, Scott, is referrals from author friends who are perhaps in your maybe if you're in a writing group and you know other people who do something in your genre and they have an agent. Um, also joining writers groups. I know, for example, if you're a romance writer, joining Romance Writers of America is an excellent way to network with other writers and learn what agents are taking what work. I used to be in that and it was phenomenal. The monthly meetings were extraordinary. So networking with other authors is another way. Another thing, Scott, is to do something somehow with an interview, an event, a block, something that is like a lightning bolt of attention on you that shows you're super unique. Like maybe you get interviewed on a certain show or podcast. Maybe you write a blog post that goes viral. Maybe, I don't know, but something that makes you just shoot onto the news in a positive way, of course, <laughs> um, that gets you some national or even local attention in a big positive way that's like, hey, He's got a phenomenal book. Like maybe Halloween is coming up. What if you do an, an enactment of your book? Or what if you have, you know what I'm saying? Like some yeah. kind of 
event that corresponds to the book to draw really cool attention. And you're in Madison, Wisconsin. So the local media is going to be looking for some kind of Halloween story. And if you had some really creative thing, or even as like a series on your podcast where you're reading from the book, you know, like the scariest scenes or something like that, you know, generate that attention yourself. And then they'll be like, wow, we want to publish you. Awesome. Let's make this that lightning bolt interview an event. How about that? What do you <laughs> have questions it. for me that will get this video viral and will attract an agent? What questions do you have? Oh, so I would ask you what sets your zombie story apart from all other zombie stories that have been done? Like why now and why should we want to read about your zombie creation? Well, <clears throat> The House on Sheridan Drive, the short story submission that's going in the anthology, that is my only zombie work. So the other works don't involve zombies. I'll say what makes the zombie work unique that uh, you're going to publish yes. is that it came out of a dream. Oh, I, I literally that. dreamed this story. I you know, painted it up a little bit, but like I was this little girl in this story. And I found this portal in between worlds, in between the zombie world and my world. And that's where the dream takes place. I will not spoil it for those. You have to buy the anthology or go to Two Sisters. Maybe you've got it in the archives, House on Sheridan Drive. But you you read that. It's, it's kind of the... Um, who is the enemy here? And that self-discovery and who is the, who's the real zombie is kind of the it. question I'm asking. Uh huh. And it was a dream. And it's like, oh my gosh, where did that dream come from? I'm not even as, I am a, uh, you know, currently only published nonfiction. So you are my first uh, publication receiving my, my fiction work. And now wow. I've got four novels in the fiction category that are post-apocalyptic. And the thing that makes them unique, Elizabeth, I'm not interested in the collapse of civilization. I'm interested in what happens after the dust settles. And so in this set of stories, it's a little bit of the meek inheriting the earth. So the, the recovery, I never really describe very thoroughly what happened. It's 30 years after some global collapse. And now corporations have filled the vacuum that governments have left. And it's small societies, fairly religious societies. So one book is focused on the Wisconsin Mennonites. One book is focused on Ethiopian Orthodox saving the world. One is on uh, Bengali Sufis in London and one on Irish Catholics, uh, monastic orders. And so kind of little communities close to the earth who recover most quickly, and they are in tension with the corporations who have filled the vacuum of governments. That's the kind of story I'm interested in. Okay. Is that four books or is there, that all in one? There are four. Those are all four different books. Two of them are more or less complete. I'm going through a heavy round of, you know, my fifth edits. And the other two are um, like one of them, I decided to do one of those, write a book in 30 days. Uh -huh. And so I did that every day. I'm going to write 1,500, 2,000 words. And I'm just going to stream of consciousness, tell this story. I don't know where it's going. And so that one just needs to be, uh, you know, I got the bones of a really good story there. Uh -huh. And then the other one's probably a third done, the Bengali Sufi one. But no, two complete books two in various stages. Wow. Okay. Here's what I recommend. Here's a whole nother angle. What you can do is do some essay writing and get it published in a major publications. For example, I read the New York times every day and there are, you can submit an op-ed piece that they have a new name for, but anyway, you can write and they'll 
if they like it. And so the themes of dystopia and corporate takeovers and religious factions, you know, those are really current themes that are fascinating for a lot of people. So if you can spin some kind of current events message, and then at the bottom, it says Scott Bessenecker is a novelist with four novels about, you know, post-apocalyptic religion, corporate clashing, or however you summarize uh-huh. it. So see what do I mean? something that's in the nonfiction realm that uh, touches on the big ideas that I'm trying to address in this fiction book. Yes. So that would kind of uh, create you, amplify you as an authority on this topic. And maybe people would interview you like, wow, I loved your op-ed piece in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington or Huff Post, you know, and I, you know, we want to interview you about this fascinating um, topic that you, you d- explored. Okay, great. Thanks for the advice, Elizabeth. You're so welcome. This is exciting. And so, you know, those themes are really powerful and relevant right now. You yeah. Know? Like, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of the, for instance, stuff, uh, looking at the Hasidic Jewish community, a lot of it's negative. In my post-apocalyptic, post-dystopian world, there, there is a kinder, gentler version of the Hasidic community. So mm-hmm. the, the Hasidic Jews are in my story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Mennonites, as you can imagine, they have so many similar aspects to them. Mennonites, you know, they're living in this... Um, uh, kind of insular reality, and yet it's their connection to a community that allows them to survive this catastrophe because they band together and they create these little, you know, kind of monastic like communities, sort of like the Dark Ages. So, I don't know if you're familiar with um, a book called How the Irish Save Civilization. No, it's a book that looks at the Irish as like during the dark ages, they preserved writing, they preserved education, they preserved the uh, arithmetic of the day through their monastic orders and little communities would grow up around them. So it's sort of like, what if out of another dark ages, something like the radical youth monks and nuns um, rose up and, you know, were in tension with the corporate entities that are trying to basically fill the vacuum of governments. Mm. So it's a little anti-corporate, which is, you know, that's an easy sell these days. What's a harder sell is, you know, after things like Orthodox uh, on Netflix is selling small religious communities as like kind of the heroes or kind of the meek inheriting the earth. Mm, That one, I think, will just make it a, a little different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love it. And the house on Sheridan Street is delightful. You wrote that for one of our monthly short story contests, July 2020. So your story will be published in our international anthology of stories for 2020, which will be hopefully coming out later this year. So congratulations on being a winner and getting published in our anthology. I hope it's the first of many, many opportunities for you to publish your fiction. So, wow, we've provided lots of different angles that you can take to put yourself in the spotlight. So Scott, I know there's another realm of the world that you're very passionate about. And perhaps, you know, your lightning bolt moment could also come in that type of recognition. Do you want to talk about it? Sure. What is my other lightning bolt recognition possibility? Oh, helping young people with anxiety and depression. Yeah. You know, Uncle Scott Reads is the podcast. And what I appreciate about this generation, which my generation, other generations, you know, every generation looks down on the one coming up after it. Uh, so Xers, man, we were the bad boys for a while. Like boomers just hated on Xers and Xers <laughs> hated on millennials and millennials are hating on Gen Z. Okay. Oh. That's just the way it is. But uh, one of the hateful things that are said, like, this is the most medicated generation ever or whatever, because they're, they're, you know, so mentally ill or whatever, you know, anxious, anxiety, and depression. 
what I, I try to do is like, I'm not a counselor. I'm just a guy who has nieces and nephews, both real and surrogate that are like, Hey, listen, you're going to be okay. Oh, I love that. It's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. The, the panic attack you had today that you're beating yourself up for over a really little, little thing. You know what? There are ways you carry the wounds of this world. Like I never had to, you are exposed to such horror that I never did. And that comes out in how you have your panic attacks over little things. What's what I'm proud of you for carrying the world's wounds in this way. And don't be so hard on yourself because you've been exposed to so many awful things. I mean, look today at Afghanistan, uh, but you know, the earth is dying. Uh, racial tensions in America are likely as bad as they've been in 60 years. Like you're carrying that. I'm so proud that you're, that you're able to move through that. Now we're going to set that aside. Stop beating yourself. So, you know, I'm talking to their anxiety and I'm talking to their depression as a non-professional, as an uncle mm -hmm. saying, um, let me talk to your inner critic, put them, put them on the line here. <laughs> Listen here, lay off them. I know they're not perfect. That's okay. Um, you need to stop talking to them the way you're talking to them. I want you to shut up now, put them back on the line. Now I've just told your inner critic, to shut up. So, you know, if, if they start talking, you just say, uncle Scott told you to be quiet. Oh. So, you know, that's the sort of uh, uncle like approach that is non uh, counselor. It's just like, I'm a guy, I see you. And now I'm going to read a classic short story by Anton Chekhov. He's this Russian guy. He wrote like a hundred years ago. It's called the bet. You're probably going to fall asleep listening to it. That's okay. You know, it, I want you to fall asleep. Now, first of all, I want you to feel your bed, you know, and I'll kind of go through that relaxation thing. And then I'll read the bet by uh -huh. Anton Chekhov in this, you know, really sleepy voice. Mm -hmm. And I get people who say, I didn't even hear the first sentence of the story. Like I was just asleep. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, I preach sometimes at my church. I talk to students for my job and I notice people when I'm speaking, when I'm preaching, they're nodding off. And I feel like I <laughs> I've got a superpower here. Like I've got a gift. I can just put people to sleep. Oh. I should do a podcast. Well, there are things like that on YouTube where you can listen to uh, videos that help you fall asleep. I had insomnia during the pandemic, during the winter, and it was terrible. And I would listen to these. There's, there's a lot of them that do work and they have music that's like 528 HZ or mega. I don't know. I, I don't uh -huh. want to say it wrong. Yeah, that's just soothing and yeah, yeah. in that right Maybe. range or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's the solution to get an agent. You need to find a Gen Z person who needs to hear you talk to their inner critic, calm their anxiety and depression, and they'll be so impressed with how you help them. They're going to be like, I want to represent, represent you with your books. Yes. <laughs> Let's hope that there is an age, a millennial or Gen Z agent out there listening to Uncle Scott Reads. See, you never know how that cross-pollination is going to assist you in your ultimate goal. Uh-huh. No, that's good to, to suggest. Like, yeah. you don't just choose one track when no. you're looking. You, like, look at all the things that you have, and you've got this random podcast for insomniacs, and you have this... <laughs> kind of faith-based nonprofit that you work for and you're really into, you know, addressing corporate issues and like use all of those paths to seek an agent. See, absolutely. That is the way the world works. It's all about relationships. And when you click with that one special person, 
You never know. People actually get book deals sitting on an airplane, meeting the random person next to them who happens to be a literary agent. So that kind of stuff does happen. And I call it lightning bolts. So when you believe in that kind of stuff, you start to attract it. And through all these wonderful, wonderful avenues that you have going, um, I think you're going to connect with your perfect agent who's going to get you a book deal for four books. Yeah. You know what? I think now you correct me if, if I'm wrong, but like agents and publishers are like, I want to know that you've got other things right. that can follow on this and yes. that you're not just like, this is the one book you've written in your whole life. And it's all your energy has been put into this one book, but like there's a career ahead of you. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, Scott. A, a literary agent recently just told me that because I was talking with her about a memoir and they're like publishers don't want to invest in a one hit wonder if they make that initial investment in your book in promoting you in all the things that go into it they want to know that you can they're they're grooming you for a long-term career which means long-term benefits for the publisher because the bottom line with publishers is they want to make a good return on their investment in you as the author and that's why many of them want you to have a platform of 10,000 followers to ensure Sure that you have a machine to plug in to sell that book. Yeah. Well, would you like me to read uh, a little bit? It might put you to sleep, but a little bit of <laughs> my so. um, uh, an excerpt from uh, the the Wisconsin Mennonite story. Sure. So, um, so in this situation, we've got. Uh, the Gold Temple Oil Corporation, they're kind of the bad guys. And uh, Terrence, African-American guy who's working for Gold Temple Oil at their detention center. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. And like, I don't know, five or seven minutes. Is that okay? Are we? Yeah, we typically we okay? end after 30 minutes, but it's fine if you'd like to read something for five minutes. That's fine. Okay. Terrence spends the last minutes of his shift rolling five cigarettes and muttering curses under his breath. Smoking's not allowed on the premises, and he's had a nagging impulse to light up since 4.30 a.m. At least the anticipation of lighting up, which rolling a cigarette elicits, bears the faint outline of satisfaction that the act itself provides. The prohibition on smoking in or near the Gold Temple Oil Detention Center is not on account of any health concerns for employees. The corporation has little concern for the well-being of guards, let alone criminals. It's that the corporate, corporate detention center is fashioned from the bones of an abandoned high school, and it sits just a few blocks away from the corporate headquarters. The place is a tinderbox, and fires are all too close to the living memory of anyone older than 20. Although the building bears cinder block walls and tile floors, the place is illuminated by oil sconces lining the walls. The ceilings are covered in decorative wooden slats, which survived the scavenging and looting that followed the nocturne. The novels all start with nocturne. That's the event that I sometimes refer to. The one by four slats set up on edge and stained a golden brown serve as a solitary redeeming aesthetic of the windowless structure. A building without windows was thought to reduce daydreaming by students, but this is, uh, but in this new reality, it serves as yet another attribute which would make extinguishing a fire in the two story complex difficult. Terrence walks past the guard room and out the building at 7.01 a.m. The guard captain looks at his watch. It is slow, off by three minutes, 6.58. The man shakes his head in disgust. Lazy ass char skin, he mutters, recording 6 a.m. as Terrence's clock out time. Across Lakeside Avenue from the facility is Willard Park. It's where employees of the detention center park their bicycles. The park sports a giant rubber stamp sculpture with the word free carved into the stamp face. The free stamp mocks a city where nothing is free. Even corporate uniforms required by anyone with a corporate job are paid for by employees, though it goes unnoticed by some when taken out of the first week's pay. Snow has fallen st since his shift began, but the cold feels good after 12 hours in the stuffy facility, reeking of paraffin and body odor. 
All too quickly, Terrence burns through the first of his cigarettes as he sits on a bench near the bike racks. He's barely begun to decompress from work, still mulling over the guard captain's stringency. He steals himself against the urge to light another when Hal arrives, pushing his clanging cart hung round with metal items. Hal Meeker is a tinkerman, repairing all manner of metal items, selling refurbished tin cups, plates, and cutlery, and providing knife sharpening services. He'll sometimes fix a horseshoe if the need is great and the pay is good, but the smithies will cut a tinkerman down where he stands if they catch him doing it. And as a Shawnee Indian, Howe would have little luck in corporate courts against a blacksmith guild tightly controlled by the Corporate Committee on Trade. But the Indian is old, born well before the nocturne, and there are few who remember pre-nocturne life firsthand. On that account alone, he might just be allowed to get away with filching a client or two from the smithies so long as he can entertain them all with stories about the olden times. Damnable day, Terence says, caving in to his urge and pulling another cigarette from his coat pocket. Don't go putting a hex on a day that ain't started yet, Hal says. Your day may just be starting, but my day has come to a crashing in, and it's been a damnable one. He lights a fag, closes his eyes, and draws in a deep drag from the crooked white finger of his cigarette. Hal allows Terence to sit in the slow dissipation of his damnable day, letting the nicotine play its part. Another long drag, holding the smoke in his lungs like a clam diver, then pluming, then a pluming cloud exhaled upon the November air. I think I'll stop there. Wow, the imagery is just spectacular. That's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Wow. I like how you call it the nocturne. Yes, you know, and I never explain it yet. It may be in one of the books, but it's like one of the last offices of prayer in the monastic community. It's like Mm -hmm. right between darkness and light is Mm -hmm. the nocturne. It's an office of prayer, but I never explain that. So that's just for you and these lightning bolt listeners who are going to be like, oh, that's cool. I wish someone would agent that so that someone would publish that. (laughs) There we go. See, (laughs) I hope that you get your wish, Scott. You're very talented, and I immensely appreciate you switching roles tonight to interview me on Writer Talks instead of me interviewing you. (laughs) Great. Well, sometime I want you and Catherine in the same room. I want to talk about how this has affected your relationship with one another. Oh, it's enhanced it tremendously. Yeah, I'll bet it has. Yeah, it's, it's really cool because we both have similar skills and also diverse skills that we bring to the table. It's very unique and it's really cool. We even published our mother's book, which she wrote herself. Sweet. So we don't know of any other sisters and mother trio writing and publishing books that the daughters publish. Sweet. Thanks. And our mother's book is gonna be made into a movie. So a documentary film. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank and you. when do you expect that that will be um, aired? We don't know, but it's it, we're doing like pre-production stuff right now. Yeah. So really exciting. So you never know where your writing can take you. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. Sure. Well, Scott Bessenecker, thank you so much for joining me here on Writer Talks. You've been amazing. Great. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I wish you the absolute best success in securing that literary agent to get your four novels published. (laughs) Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. You're welcome. And thank you all of you for joining us here on Writer Talks. Please do give us a thumbs up, like the video, subscribe to the channel, drop a comment, ask a question, or if you want to recommend a literary agent for Scott, please do. (laughs) (laughs) Or if you're an agent writing, please do. Um, I'll put some contact information for him in the description box so you can get in touch with him. And also you can follow me at Elizabeth Atkins on Twitter or at two sisters writing. It's the number two sisters writing. You can also hop over to two sisters writing.com and check out all the winning stories. If you don't see Scott's story yet there, the house on Sheridan street, it will be there soon because he is the July, 2020 winner of our short story contest, which will be published in our fourth annual international anthology of writers. So thank you again for writing 
for watching Writer Talks. I'm Elizabeth Ann Atkins, and I wish you happy reading and happy writing. We'll see you next time. Peace.